Hi. I've done many videos, podcasts, TV and radio interviews, speaking at public events through the years. But one thing I've never really touched on or explained was my own personal spiritual journey. My experiences and uh, inspirations uh, that have played their parts in my evolution as a spiritual healer and my practice and understanding relating to the mind and the spirit for whatever reason now feels like a good time to tell some of that story. It's true that even as a child, I did feel a sort of what you might call a spiritual calling. I did feel that that was the direction I belonged in and the direction I would eventually go in. At various points of my life, when I was working, for lack of a better term, regular jobs, uh, a little bit of me always felt like I should be doing the kind of thing I'm doing now. Almost a feeling of almost guilt, you know, disappointment, um, letting myself down just a little bit. <laughs> now, my father, Bert Gelfand, had uh, studied psychology in college. And we had some really interesting talks. My father was a very intelligent, interesting, insightful man. And I remember talking with him and learning about uh, things like the ideas of hysterical conversion and catharsis and such ideas. You know, he was familiar with these early concepts of uh, Joseph Breuer and Carl Jung and Freud. And uh, that was certainly very interesting to me. That was certainly, the mind was certainly an item of interest. I did study uh, on my own time, independently in the, in the school library, you know, books relating to psychology on my own time. And as things like meditation became popular, and uh, you know, ideas of mind and spirit expansion uh, kind of passed through the music of the era, too. Um, I certainly felt inspired by that. That interested me and seemed like a, a path I was meant for. And uh, touch on, first of all, a particular spiritual experience. One day I was taking a hike through the, uh, the Wachung Reservation uh, in uh, uh, New Jersey here, Union County, New Jersey. Uh, Wachunks uh, from a Native American language of uh, indigent peoples literally means big hills. It's a wonderful, beautiful area and uh, I've taken hikes through there literally hundreds of times, still do fairly frequently. It's a very special place for me, and I'm sure many other people. One time I was taking a walk by myself. I think it was springtime. This would have been, I believe I was 17 years old. And I felt this consciousness around me, this awareness coming from all the life around me, literally the weeds and the trees and everything, I definitely felt this consciousness, this awareness, uh, I guess a, a term that uh, seems to fit for me in describing all of us and all life, a collective consciousness. This, uh, the sense I got was a very peaceful, uh, recognition of me from all the life around me. It felt like all the life around me 
was a collective consciousness. It was sort of unified, like, uh, I don't know, like a, a bunch of people watching a stranger walk down the street, but with, uh, with sort of a passive interest is maybe the best way I could describe it. It was like very exciting for me. It was just kind of yeah, mind blowing, you know, but I know what I felt. I know what I perceived. And for me, I will always know and have known always since that moment that all life is sentient. All life is aware. And all life, in a certain sense, is a collective consciousness, is an us, all of us, all life. Which is not to uh, say that we don't exist in an individuality as well. Uh, one way I've heard it put before, which is, I think, a good enough metaphor, is it's like we're all this big ocean and each of us is a drop. And that was a profoundly mind-shifting spiritual experience for me. And I feel that from all, all life. Sometimes when uh, I'm more present, you know, I'm not engaged in thought. Uh, I try to spend more and more time being more and more present and just feeling that connection, that usness. It's a beautiful thing. And I think that itself is what spirituality really is. And so all life is sentient. For me, that's not a theory. It's not a belief. It's very, very tangible. And I imagine it's very tangible for anyone who allows himself to notice it. And it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. Another uh, profoundly spiritual experience for me is sort of framed in a, a mundane circumstance. And this was in 1976. I was driving my car, which was an old Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> uh, I got very cheaply that had like smooth bald tires, really <laughs> quite unsafe, as the story will illustrate. <clears throat> I was driving on in New Jersey uh, on Route 22 East. My father always used to say that uh, Route 22 is the most dangerous highway in the state. And I'm sure it is to this day because of the way it's set up. You've got uh, two or three lanes, depending on uh, which stretch, uh, running east towards Newark. And you've got two lanes uh, running in the western direction with, uh, at, at points, sort of an, a, an island in between the eastbound and westbound lanes populated with uh, retail stores for the most part. And it's still that way today. So you've got a lot of people making left-hand turns from the left-hand lane into a, a store parking lot, which of course that's the passing lane, so that's a little dicey. On top of that, it's not unusual to see people suddenly shift from the middle lane across the left lane in front of a driver to make it into a store parking lot. You know, fearing that, uh, oh my God, I'm gonna miss it if I don't go here. Well, the better thing to do, I mean, there's so many turnarounds you just go up a little further, get in the left lane, turn around and come back. But a lot of times there's sort of a panic that sets in like, uh oh, I've got to get over there. Accidents happen that way. And uh, I've had people do that in front of me. Just suddenly I'm in the left lane, they're in the middle lane, and all of a sudden they shoot right in front of my car. <laughs> it's a real daredevil experience. Anyway, so I was coming westbound so uh, through the town of Hillside, around, I would estimate, around 
3 o'clock, 3.30 in the afternoon on a weekday, which is there's just tremendous traffic. And uh, the traffic was moving at about 45 to 50 miles an hour. And it was very congested traffic moving that quickly. And it was raining. And I was in the passing lane, in the left-hand lane. The road was a little wet. And uh, I felt like I was getting a little too close to the car in front of me. So I just feathered the brake. And as soon as I just feathered the brake a little bit, because the tires had no traction, the car went into a spin. The Volkswagen Beetle went into a spin, a really quick spin. And I was spinning across from left to right, crossing over the, the, the right-hand lane in which there was a big truck coming straight at my car. I was just spinning like a top. And I just had this sensation or feeling of death. I mean, there was no doubt I was going to die. I had no doubt, it was total acceptance. It wasn't fear because it was like a fate accompli that I was, I was dead and there was no way around it. And it was sort of a peaceful or numb feeling and a feeling of acceptance. And I could hear the horn uh, of the truck, the car driver of the truck was, arr, arr, arr. I'm never gonna forget that sound. And he was gonna smash right into me. He had no choice, nothing he could do but hit his, hit his horn. I had nothing to do. My car was spinning, what was I gonna do? And something happened, which is why I'm not dead. I heard the sound of the truck horn, everything spinning around me. I have no control over my direction whatsoever. Completely uh, uh, caught up in the, I guess what you call the centrifugal force as the car's spinning around Dis, kind of disoriented and the car stopped spinning. The sound of the truck horn faded and all those cars all around me going at 45, 50 miles an hour. I mean, there was no brake, there was no space except a few feet between each car moving that quickly. When my car stopped spinning, there was no collision. There was no banging into anything. And when my car stopped spinning, I was still on the highway. Now, at this time of day, there's no such thing as no traffic. There's no such thing as light traffic. Those of you in the area know this. But there was not a single vehicle. They were all gone. They were all gone. I was alone on Route 22 in the hillside area, my car facing the wrong way, and nothing was coming at me. It was total silence. It was sort of eerie. I sat there, the, the car stalled out, and I sat there for probably, well, it was probably just, you know, 15 seconds, maybe, I don't really know, but I sat there regaining my senses, and at the same time, I don't know what the, the term would be, um, not confused, startled, I don't know. It was kind of a peaceful but surprised feeling. Like, how could this be? What happened? It was like I was in another dimension. The environment suddenly shifted. I was in the same spot but everybody else was gone. So after whatever it was, 10, 12, 15, 20 seconds, after I got over this feeling of confusion and amazement and sort of, to some degree, regained my orientation and my senses, I said, well, I'm not gonna sit here forever this happened, and I, I, I started the car up again, and I drove home, and gradually more traffic reappeared until it was back up to what it really is at that time. There is no 
reasonable, objective explanation for how that traffic disappeared. There's no traffic light behind me coming from the direction the cars were going in that would have caused a break in the traffic. None. That time of day, the traffic certainly doesn't thin out, let alone disappear completely, ever. That's not what happened. And I have no explanation whatsoever for what happened, except some sort of inexplicable miracle did occur. I only came to realize in the past few years, more than 40 years later, doing what I'm doing, working as a spiritual healer, helping people connect spiritually to actually feel other people's feelings, whoever they're in various relationships with, to connect with them and resolve uh, their hostilities or problems between them, to actually connect people spiritually, which is really simple and easy to do, at least for me, to have people do that, and feel all the thoughts and feelings in the other person, which results in a total shift of, of harmony and uh, affinity between themselves and the other person. The commonly, commonly, the other person immediately has a, has a much more affectionate, friendly attitude towards them, you know, because of what took place spiritually. That's part of what I do. Um, I have come to understand that life Whoever, whatever beings involve recognized or decided that my spiritual work, what I would provide, make available for the collective consciousness to make my contribution, to bring us together and heal from pain and fear, that this should not be the, the, that should not be the stopping point. You know, that I'm, I'm meant, I was meant and am meant to continue to be, to move forward and evolve, to come to do the work I'm doing today. We are all driven by our passions. And I believe that we are all brilliant in whatever we are passionate about. And spiritual healing and enlightenment is certainly one of my passions. And so anything can and will be accomplished where that passion is there. And that of course, was a profoundly spiritual experience that, of course, has always stayed with me. And like I said, I've only fairly recently come to better understand and appreciate how it happened and why it happened that way. And also, more or less in that same time period, maybe the next year, 1977. It was a very, very difficult time in my younger life. I was uh, very unhappy, felt very disassociated and disconnected from life, from others, very sad, and kind of lost. And I had, I guess you'd call it a vision, three people appeared in front of me. Now, they were pretty ordinary looking young adults, dressed neatly, you know, nothing. They didn't appear like aliens or gods or saints or angels. You know, they, they appeared 
Uh, but they had this beneficence about them, and the three of them, I think it was two boys and a girl, they just smiled at me very benignly. And I said, I know you can't be real, you know. They smiled at me. And knowingly, <laughs> and uh, then, then they just vanished, they disappeared. Shortly after that, my life began to change and I began to actively work in certain contexts relating to, uh, you could say, a spiritually therapeutic approach to the mind and spirit. Maybe the first leg of my journey of actively working with others to help them to accomplish their passions and relieve their fear and their pain. And uh, life changed at that point. And I was very enthused to be actively on that path. I could probably think of other moments, but these are probably the most interesting and the most profound. And these, more than anything else I could talk about, can be uh, considered to be the basis of my, uh, my outlook, my passion, my purpose, and uh, who I am and what I'm here for. So I've talked about in all my other videos, the mind, the spirit, techniques, and so forth. But this one is about my personal journey. And uh, now I can see that that was a real point of omission, not to give you some insight and background about me, the person doing all this talking and doing all this work. So I hope you find this interesting. And thank you for being here and being part of us and this collective consciousness. And I hope that this will inspire and enlighten you to recognize that all life is sentient. All life is us. All life is aware. And as an us, maybe that's just another aspect or way of recognizing that existence is love and love is existence. And we're all here to be with and as and for each other in this collective consciousness and to promote and share and display and contribute our particular voice and our particular uniqueness to this world in whatever way we are impassioned to do so. Thanks for watching.